Welcome to Module 6 on the development of UHBC Structural Design Guidance and Specifications. We're pleased to welcome our speaker, Benjamin Graybill, Structural Engineer in the Office of Infrastructure Research at the Federal Highway Administration. Ben? All right. Thank you, Mary Lou. Excited to be here. Great to uh, sort of close down this uh, day-long event. Um, number six, thanks to everybody for, for sticking around here till the end. Uh, yes, as Mary Lou said, um, I work for the U.S. Department of Transportation. I'm the team leader in charge of bridge engineering research, uh, and I have a long history working with UHPC. At this point, I'm over 20 years working on this topic, um, and I've said it before, but I'll say it again. I think we're right on the cusp. Uh, this is this is really catch and hold. A lot of people are seeing a lot of interest in this technology, a lot of things we can do with it. Uh, and I'll spend the next few minutes uh, talking about structural design, structural design guidance, specification development, and some of the things that that, that we need uh, that we're, we're getting to that, that are just over the horizon and that they're going to really facilitate um, some advancements in, uh, in UHPC. Um, ultra high performance concrete. Now, let's be clear what we're talking about here. So, UHPC is an enabling technology. UHPC is not a solution in and of itself it enables other solutions. So, you know, many of you I'm sure have heard about UHPC connections. There's been some talk about them today uh, in, in prefabricated bridge construction. So UHPC allows us to build those connections in a more robust way. It lets us make PBE solutions work. UHPC can be used as overlays for um, repairing deteriorated bridge decks. So there have, there have there have been bridge decks for a long time made of reinforced concrete. There have been other solutions for repairing those decks. UHPC allows us to create a new solution to that challenge. So, so again, UHPC, it's an enabling technology. It can help us build infrastructure that performs better. But now, in the title of the presentation, I used the word hurdle. And I think some people might have seen that and they thought that's kind of negative. You know, the next hurdle for UHPC, as if we've had a lot of hurdles, you know, structural design guidance and specification development. And so yeah, hurdle may seem a little negative. Maybe I could have used challenge or could have used opportunity, but but I think hurdle is accurate. So for those of us who have been working on UHPC, who have been paying attention to this topic for a while, you know, I, I think I think it is a hurdle. Um, we've we've been working to deliver solutions to de to develop solutions that are UHPC based, and we know that there's 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 always some things that are sort of standing in the way that we need to 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 address to move beyond. So in terms of structural design with UHPC or, or getting to the point where we're making full structures out of UHPC, we know that the structural applications can be a very compelling use case. But we also know that we need structural design guidance. We, we need that guidance in order to design the structures. It will tell us how to design the structures safely. Um, and right now in the US at least, we don't have guidance that, that does that. We, we don't have structural design guidance for using UHPC as a structural material. So obviously this is a hurdle, but for those of us who work in research who are trying to advance the technology, who are into innovation, it's also an opportunity. So what I'm gonna talk about is a path forward. My group's been working hard on this, on, on this sort of path. Uh, we're, we're seeing using UHPC as, as primary structural components in, in, in structures, primarily in the infrastructure. We're seeing that to be a, a big opportunity that's right in front of us, but there's some challenges um, and we want to create that path forward so we can get to the resolution, so we can facilitate structural applications of, of UHPC. And we saw two main needs. One that was one that's bigger, and that is the structural design guidance. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but also, we, we need the engineering properties. And so a second big issue we had or big thing we needed to address was the tensile properties of UHPC. The tensile response of UHPC is a very important part of its, of its behavior. It's something that we use or we, we would be very well served to use when we're doing structural design with UHPC. But we need to understand that property. And in order to understand a, a, a structural property of a structural material, we need a test method, a test method that will help us help us capture that property, help us determine what the parameter is. So these two things are things that we've been working hard on, the, the guide specification for structural design with, with UHPC and also on a, a tensile test method for UHPC. And so my presentation here is gonna, gonna talk about these two things. But before we get too deep, let's step back and look at the big picture. What are we really trying to do here? What's our goal? So now remember, UHPC is an enabling technology. So what are we trying to achieve? 
and and this this image probably gives you a hint. You've already seen it a couple times. You can probably tell that I, I really like this image. Now, it's not especially pretty unless you are a big fan of pretension concrete bridge girders, but but I am, so that's good. Um, but it does demonstrate how with some simple modifications, we can begin to engage the advanced properties of UHPC in a form that we are familiar with. So those familiar with pretension bridge girders, you look at this and you think it looks kind of like a bridge girder, except a little different. There's, there's a few things that are a little different here. If you look down towards the bottom, you can see those strands. Um, I know you don't have a sense of scale, but they're bigger. Those are 7 tenths strands, uh, still spaced on a two inch grid, but 7 tenths strands. So those are bigger than the strands that are commonly used in, in the US. Um, but they work really well with UHPC. It's sort of a, a, a marrying technology with UHPC. If you're dealing with pretension, you can get a lot more bang for your buck. Uh, within the, the, the strand, you can get a lot more force, which can give you a, a much more efficient um, structural element that is that is pretension. So that's one part. The other thing I think you'll notice here is the web. It looks kind of skinny. Um, a normal girder that might be three or four feet deep, um, it might have, say, a six inch wide web. Um, this girder's got a three inch wide web. And this was actually fabricated. This isn't a computer generated image. This is a girder that was fabricated and tested in my laboratory. And it performs, it, it performed well. A three inch web, and I forgot to mention this web doesn't have any shear reinforcement in it. So there's no mild steel in the web to carry shear forces. So how's it do it? Well, it does it by asking the UHPC to, to perform the way we know it can. UHPC has inherent tensile performance. It has tensile resistance, both pre and post cracking. Um, so you can engage that from a structural standpoint and you can get resistance. And that resistance can be proportioned so that it addresses the demand, whatever the demand might be. And in this case, for this sort of a scale of girder, uh, you can actually, you can, you don't have to, but you can design it so that you're relying on the UHPC to carry the, the sheer demand. So this is just sort of one use case, but it's just to give you a sense of what a compelling application might be and how it doesn't have to be something that's way over the horizon, how we can take existing form work. This is a PCEF cross section that is commonly used in the mid Atlantic of the United States. You can, you can slide the forms in a little bit. You can block out the bottom. You can make some basic tweaks to the cross section, and then it becomes a, a, a solution that is closer to something optimized for UHPC, but it doesn't have a major capital expenditure necessary in order to the, get to the point of, of, of fabricating it. Okay, so moving on. So I've talked a little about the pretension girders there. Let's talk in, in, you know, on the engineering side a little bit more. So for pretension girders, this is just one of the use cases that is out there, but from an engineering side, you can design these girders so that you can span a longer distance. You can decrease the dead load of the girder and you can have a girder that is more durable than what your conventional solution might be. So depending on your point of view, any one of those things might be very valuable to you. If you can do a longer span length, maybe you're, you're replacing a grade separation interchange and you can get rid of your shoulder piers. If you can decrease the dead load, maybe you can span a longer distance. So maybe you're doing a long span, uh, you know, a, a long viaduct, type bridge and you, instead of having 10 spans, you might have say six spans and that can significantly reduce the cost of your substructures. So, you know, depending on your application, there could be different reasons why, why you want to do this. But just in general, using UHPC, it puts some more tools in your toolbox. You might be able to accelerate your construction. You could lessen constrictions at waterway crossings. You could reduce your local environmental footprint, less maintenance in the long run, less disruption. There's a lot of potential benefits that you can get in certain cases from, from using UHPC. As I think uh, Dr. Stanton said earlier, it's not the solution for everything but it is a solution sometimes. There are some places where it can be a very compelling solution and it would be great if we could get to the point where it is just another tool in the toolbox where sometimes we use UHPC to address whatever whatever need we have. So, but to get there, we need the structural design guidance. You've seen UHPC starting to be used around, around the US for things like connections and for things like overlays and beam end repairs. But when we're starting to use it in primary structural components, we need that structural design guidance. So the concept is UHPC is a structural material and it provides advantages in design and construction. But to get to the guidance, what we need is we need understand how UHPC behaves at the material level. We need to understand how the UHPC behaves at a structural level. And then we need to take those things in the same framework that we use for reinforced conventional concrete and the same sort of framework we use for structural steel, we need to take those material and structural behaviors and we need to create models and we need to turn those, those behavioral models into 
design guidance and construction guidance. It's it's not it, this is not new. This is how we deal with structural materials. Uh, it is a very um, understood process, but we can do it. We just have a new material that we're plugging in, and we need to work through the process to develop that design guidance. But it does bring us to a couple of big questions. Big questions that I've heard many times over the last few years from various different folks who sort of are on the edges of the UHPC or are getting involved with UHPC, and and they often say, but but it's concrete, right? It can't we just assume it's concrete? The Astro LRFD section five, it tells us how to design with conventional concrete. Can't we just say UHPC is conventional concrete, maybe with some extra benefits on the side? Or can't we just use the same assumptions we use with conventional concrete? You know, it would be a lot easier if, if we went down that path. And, and so what's the answer? Why can't we just do that? Or maybe we can do that. Well, an optimist might say, sure, why not? A pessimist might say, well, we need to wait until we know all the answers. Let, let's not go there. But I'm not sure any of us are either optimists or pessimists. I think many of us are engineers and scientists, and so we're probably realists. And so we're gonna look at the data, we're gonna look at the performance, we're gonna look at the facts, and then we're gonna chart a course forward that, that, that builds models, that, that sets up appropriate assumptions so that we develop guidance that is rational uh, and that is very usable. So we need to start with those fundamentals. It's not just a simple yes or no. We need to understand how UHPC behaves, start with those fundamentals, and move forward. So let's talk about conventional concrete for a minute, because people often start from the point of conventional concrete. Well, conventional concrete, when we are doing structural design with conventional concrete, we certainly use engineering mechanics. That is fundamental. We also assume that the post-cracking resistance can be ignored. Concrete doesn't offer a lot of post-cracking resistance, so, so you know, at the ultimate limit state, we're, we're really not dealing with that. Creep is something special to conventional concrete, but we have a lot of data out there, so we can empirically predict from, from that data set. And, and there is significant scatter, but we can get, get sort of a, a reasonable prediction of creep behaviors. Now, flexure and beam shear, those are two things that people think about a lot. So at the flexural ultimate limit state, we have two limits that we actually deal with commonly when, when we design reinforced concrete. We have the concrete compression, compression crushing strain. That's one of the limits. And if you get there, then you say your member has, has failed. That is a limit state. We also have the tensile reinforcement rupture strain. That's your, your mild steel reinforcement or your pre-stressing strands on the, on the flexural tension side. When they reach the rupture strain, well, you're going to rupture that steel, and that obviously is a, is a failure limit. And then the last one I'll talk about here for conventional concrete is the shear limit state. So this is in beam shear. The, the assumptions or the models that exist in the design specifications, they are dependent on reinforcement yield strength. So often that's 60 KSI in your mild steel. And concrete aggregate interlock. So we get a V sub C term and a V sub S term. And they each, the, it's superposition, you add them together but they're both dependent on some fundamental assumptions that are sort of behind the curtain, and that's reinforcement yield and, and aggregate interlock. So do these assumptions work for UHPC? Um, you can probably guess that I'm going to say, well, some of them do, and some of them, we got to think about that a little bit. So with UHPC, we're still dealing with engineering mechanics. It's still a structural material. It's still engineering mechanics. So, you know, we can, we can build on that, and that, that's a great place to start. But UHPC does, pro does provide a, a different type of tensile resistance. UHPC gives you a higher tensile strength and it, you can sustain that tensile resistance after cracking. That lets you do your design differently, but it also changes how the member behaves. And we need to remember that. If, if we skip over that point, we're gonna have members that behave in ways that, that we don't expect. And, and we don't like surprises when we're doing structural engineering. Creep behaviors. So creep is still empirical. So with UHPC, we just need some of that data. And we're getting that data. There have been studies. We have developed some data, studies studies around the world, different UHPC formulations have looked at, at creep. And so there's some data. Obviously, it's not the same volume of data that is out there for conventional concrete, but it's coming and, and we'll get there. Now for flexure, we do need to think a little bit more about how we handle flexure with UHPC as compared to conventional concrete. And the reason for that is on the flexural tension side of the element, with UHPC, we have another resisting element. So in conventional concrete, you have your, your tensile steel. With UHPC, you have the tensile steel and you have the UHPC providing tensile resistance. Now, if you want to, per, if you want to do superposition, you need to make sure all these things are acting at the same time. So you can't just assume you're going to get 
to a certain point in your tensile reinforcement strain diagram without making sure you're also still capable of carrying some resistance from the UHPC. So there's another limit state that needs to be considered. And we need to look at when we get to each to each limit. And, and I'll just give you a warning. Sometimes with UHPC, we're going to reach the UHPC limit first. Uh, we're going to get to what's called localization, which is when the fibers start to pull out of the matrix. So you stretch the UHPC, if the fibers pull out, you're going to lose, you're going to lose resistance. Um, and that's an important limit state you need to consider. And the last one I'll mention there is, is shear. Uh, the difference here between UHPC and conventional concrete is, well, the the, the limiting the, the limit state or the limiting point in shear, it's going to be dependent on both the reinforcement strain and on the UHPC tensile resistance. Remember when I said that we had a girder, I showed you a picture of a girder and I said there's no steel in there, all the shear uh, demand is carried by the UHPC. Well, then you need to make sure the UHPC is active. So if the UHPC has exceeded its strain capacity, obviously it's not going to be active. It's going to have failed. It's going to have pulled apart, and that's a problem. So when you're doing the shear design, you need to make sure you consider all these limit states. So back to the main point here, some of the assumptions are a little different when you're doing design with UHPC than with conventional concrete, and that's fine. We can get through it, uh, but we just need to, to accept that fact. All right, so um, I did say I was going to talk some about the, the tensile resistance of UHPC and tensile testing. So let's let's digress to there for just a second. So here on the uh, on the right side of the screen, I'm showing a stick of UHPC that's being pulled in tension. And this one actually has has reached its failure point, And we have a localization crack shown there there in the middle. This this is the localization crack. There's lots of other cracks in there, but this is localization where the fibers have, have started to pull out. So these other cracks are pre-localization cracks. When you pull on UHPC, you get sort of this straining behavior where there's enough fibers in there to hold the UHPC together to give you resistance that you have at least as much um, tensile resistance in terms of stress after cracking as you do when you get your first cracking. So how do we test that? Well, there are indirect ways to test that, but if you're doing an indirect way, then you're gonna have to make a series of assumptions and you're gonna have to basically um, guess how the material is behaving before it actually behaves. And that's not a great path forward, in my opinion. It's much better to do what we do in structural metals. In structural metals, we test the tensile response by pulling them in tension. We take a, a chunk of it, 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 a bar or a round or you know whatever it is, and we stick it in a testing machine and we pull on it. We measure the stress or the load. We turn it into stress by looking at cross-section. We measure the strain by looking at a gauge length. Uh, and over that gauge length, the, the deformation over the gauge length gives us strain. Why don't we do that with UHPC? Well, that's the idea. That's the test method that we've developed. And you can see there on the on the left side of the screen some pictures of testing machines running this test with a stick of UHPC. So how does UHPC behave in tension or, or what are we really trying to capture here? Well, this is a stress drain response shown on the screen in tension. Uh, and the solid black line is the behavior of the material. So it's basically elastic until it cracks. Uh, and then after it cracks, the fibers get engaged and we get more and more and more cracking until eventually we get to a point where uh, one crack becomes dominant and the fibers start to pull out. After this point, it's not really straining anymore. At this point, it's a crack opening behavior. So, but from here to here, it's a straining behavior. So we have a structural material that offers a certain stress over a certain strain range until we get to this point, this limit here, uh, where the UHPC localizes. So that's the basic tensile response of a UHPC. We need to quantify that. How do we quantify it? Well, there's a new test method. ASHTO T397 was published in July 2022, so just a couple months ago. This is a test method that, that, that my group developed. We actually started working on this about a decade ago. Uh, tested it many times. Various other labs have tested it. There's a pooled fund study that's looking at, at, at this method as well that's going to soon publish a report. Um, but basically, it's a new standard test method that directly uh, measures the tensile response of UHPC through this test method. And, and the method tells you how to both run the test and analyze the results. What it does is it lets you determine the engineering parameters that you need if you're doing design. So when you're doing design, you're going to say the tensile strength is this, the tensile strain capacity is this, and then someone needs to supply you that material. Through this test method, a vendor, whether that's someone with a non-proprietary mix or a commercial mix, whatever it is, they can run this test to say their material meets the requirements set forth in your design. Um, so again, this this was published a couple months ago. Astro published it, published it, so uh, it is available out there for anyone who wants to to purchase it from Astro. 
All right, so that's a little bit on the on the tensile test, uh, which is is a very important part that builds into the guide specification for structural design with UHPC. But now looking to the bigger thing, so if we're trying to get down this path, we need that guide specification for structural design with UHPC. So where does that stand? So my group at Federal Highway, we have been developing uh, uh, this this guidance. Uh, we basically said a, a very um, practical path forward would be to look at how the Astro community commonly embraces new technologies. And what they commonly do is they, they, they publish what's called a, a guide specification. So it doesn't go into the LRFD bridge design spec right away. It's a standalone document called a guide spec that deals with the particular technology, whatever it is. So my group at Federal Highway, we, we offered to Astro T10, that's the Structural Concrete Design Committee, we offered to them that we would uh, work to develop such a thing and, and provide it to them so for their consideration and they could decide whether they wanted to push it forward for, for Astro's uh, publication. Um, so that's where we are. Um, a, a little over a year ago, we provided that uh, a, a draft to Astro T10 uh, and they're considering it. They've been, been talking it through, they've been um, having, we've been having a lot of meetings over the last year to talk about various different aspects of it. Um, and their goal is to, to continue pushing this forward. Um, and if all goes well, by, by next summer, it, it might be on the ballot uh, at, at the Astro Bridge uh, event. So this is not published yet, um, but it is working towards that direction. Uh, it, is, it is something that is sort of in the works and, and pretty far along. To give you a sense of what's in there, uh, it's in a very comfortable format. It's in a code and commentary type format, just like what the Astro LRFD bridge design specification is written. And here you can see some pieces from the very beginning of that. So section 111, just in general, it says, here's what UHPC is, because we have to have a box that we're working in. So there, there are certain engineering parameters that your material has to display in order to be considered a, a UHPC. So we've proposed what you what you see on the left side of the screen there, that's the code side. And it, there's a compressive strength, a, a minimum compressive strength, a minimum cracking strength. Um, it says it has to be a hardening material, which means the strength after cracking is higher than the cracking strength. And you have to have at least uh, in this, what we proposed, 0025 of strain, uh, strain capacity uh, when when the UHPC localizes. Um, so those are basic engineering parameters that, that are necessary in order to be in this box. Uh, we're also pointing out some limitations and that is, you know, this guidance is good for a lot of things, but it wasn't designed with the special attributes of post-tension structures in mind. Um, so it's not to say the concepts don't work, but it's not designed first and foremost for, for post-tension structures. It also isn't designed for seismic applications. That's not to say UHPC doesn't work in seismic zones, but it wasn't, you know, it doesn't provide guidance on how to detail plastic hinge regions, for instance. Um, so there are some, some limitations as far as it, it stands right now. Um, this, this overall framework, just to give you a, a look at the table of contents uh, of the draft that we've provided to Ashto, um, it's very familiar if you're familiar with uh, section five of the Astro LRFD. That's the section that deals with structural concrete design. So basically section one through section 10 here, section one scope through section 10 reinforcement, they all basically have the same titles and they talk about the same stuff. Um, the, the two sort of work together. The UHPC guidance here, um, it, it speaks to what is special about UHPC. But if there's something that is the same, between UHPC and conventional concrete, then we're not gonna regurgitate it in, in this guide spec for UHPC. We're just gonna say, use the same guidance you already have for, for, conventional, for conventional concrete. And, and that happens sometimes. Um, this work um, that, that we have uh, developed and proposed Ashto, uh, you know, it's based on physical behaviors of UHPC structural elements. Uh, it is based on fundamental engineering mechanics. Uh, it, is, it is pretty rational, I, I would say. It's also founded on work that we have published in, in peer-reviewed journals uh, and some work others have published in, in journals as well. So we, we've gone to sort of the, 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 the researcher sort of gold standard for what you do. When, when you're doing research, high quality research, you publish it in peer reviewed journals, you look at other work published in peer reviewed journals, uh, and you carry that forward and use that as sort of the basis for, for what you're building. And so as I said, it's being considered right now by, by Ashto uh, T10. All right, just to give you a, a look under the hood a little bit, if you think about how we do structural design, we basically have models that model the behavior of structural materials. So. I said earlier that we might have a stress strain response that looks something like this, and this might come out of Ashto T397. That's that new test method Ashto has for UHPC tensile response. So you run that test, you use the test method, and it gives you certain engineering parameters, like the, the, um, the tensile strength 
of the, the UHVC at cracking or the strain at localization. So you get these parameters and then and you put those into a model. And so if you had a material that, that looked like this and how it behaved, it's gonna go into a model that looks like this. This is a tensile response model for the UHBC. It's an elastic plastic model where it's elastic until you get to the cracking strength and then it's plastic until you get the localization strain. So that's the model. You also have a model for the compression behavior of UHPC, that's important too. And we build those things then into the next step, which is say flexure. So if you're dealing with flexure, flexure is still flexure. You have the materials that are on the compression side of the neutral axis, you have the materials on the tension side of the neutral axis, and you sum the forces and the forces have to, to equal zero. So we've got our compression model here on the compression side of the axis. We've got our tension model here for the UHPC on the tension side. And we also have the discrete reinforcement that's providing tension down here and compression up here in this particular cross section. Uh, we, we sum those things, we, we do basic flexure, but we have to think about the failure modes. We have to think of what happens first, because once you go past one of the failure modes, you can't do superposition anymore. This whole process breaks down. So you have to stop when you get to your first failure mode. And with the UHPC flexural element, often that will be tensile crack localization of the UHPC. So we need to think about all those failure modes as we're dealing with the UHPC. Shear design um, is, is a little more complicated, I think everyone will agree, than, than flexural design. Um, but what we've done in, in our proposal to Ashto is we've built on what is currently in uh, section five of the LRFD for shear, which is the modified compression field theory. So the modified compression field theory, basically you, you're taking an element in the web, so you take the web of your, your element um, and you create some equilibrium equations and you assume some behaviors and you solve a whole series of equations to come out with a, a relationship for the, um, the resistance provided by the concrete and the resistance provided by your discrete reinforcement, your, your stirrups. We did the same thing, but we got rid of the empirical equations that deal with conventional concrete. So we don't have aggregate interlock in UHPC, but we do have tensile resistance in the UHPC. So we basically wrote a couple different equations than the ones that are in uh, MCFT. So we re-derived it using engineering mechanics from the beginning uh, and out the back end pops an equation, just like what you have for, for MCFT of conventional concrete. Now you have uh, uh, relationships for, for UHPC. Um, in, in real simple terms, you basically can create a free body diagram that looks something like this. Um, through the equations, uh, you determine theta um, and you look at the shear resistance along this plane, this diagonal crack uh, that is, it's it's the shear resistance of, of the UHPC element. Um, so. Um, a couple things that are important to know, uh, theta is different, um, so you can't just use the theta you get from, from conventional concrete. And also you can't just assume the steel bars are yielding. So if you have stirrups in your element, uh, you can't just assume they're yielding uh, because UHPC may have reached its localization strain before those steel bars yield. Um, and if that's the case, then assuming yield means you're doing superposition, but you're not superimposing things that are happening at the same time. And that's that's a problem. But when it comes down to it, you just solve the equations. We, we've done all the hard work for you. Uh, you solve the equations and out the end pops your, your, your capacity. So with that, I'll, I'll close up here. So the goal here was to talk about a path to uh, UHPC structural design. We saw two big things that, that needed to happen. We needed to understand and quantify those tensile behaviors a little better. Um, so we, we worked uh, to develop a test method uh, and then we worked with Ashto's a hardened concrete committee uh, in Ashto materials um, to uh, develop and, and uh, release that test method. So that's been done now. Uh, back a couple of months ago. We also developed a, a guide specification for structural design with UHPC. It uses those basic material properties. It uses compression, it uses tension, it uses engineering mechanics, and it develops a rational design process. Uh, it incorporates UHPC mechanical properties into an existing structural design method framework. Uh, it's, it should be very familiar to bridge designers in the US because it's very much parallel to what's in the Astro LRFD for conventional concrete. Um, the information there has been validated with data from experimental tests. And we are working with Ashto to satisfy the need. Um, this seems like a very um, straightforward way to get to the end goal, which is to work with the folks in the US who, who have the bridge design specifications. If you wanna design bridges with UHPC, let's work with them so that we can get a guide spec um, out there uh, for people to start using. So with that, it brings me back to my title slide and I will be happy to uh, field any questions that anyone might have. Okay, thank you, Ben.
We'll now begin the Q&A session. Paul? Okay, uh, thank you, Mary Lou. Ben, really, really interesting. A lot, lot to think about there. Uh, we do have a few questions, and I think they're going to be kind of interesting. The first one here is, uh, are there any case, are there case studies or guide specs uh, going to be available for bridge repair and rehab using UHPC? So, yes, and we've we've actually addressed that through a different means. So, so. Using UHPC for, for bridge preservation and repair is a topic that we are that Federal Highway is currently promoting through the Everyday Counts program. It's in Everyday Six, Everyday Count Six. Um, just about a month ago, we published um, a document that is basically um, information for people who want to use UHPC for preservation and repair. Um, I'm looking right now to find the number of the document, but you can find it by um, by going, you know, your favorite search engine and uh, uh, looking for FHWA-HRT-22, the year 2022, uh, 065. Um, that report's out there. Anybody can go look it up, uh, and it provides lots of good guidance and some case studies. Okay. But it's for specific applications. It's for those repair applications, like overlays, like beam end repairs. So it's it's narrower for specific applications. All right. Well, uh, since we're talking about that, uh, on an overlay repair, this is an interesting question. If the uh, UHPC is damaged somehow, can you repair the the uh, small damage with regular concrete? Ooh, um, hmm. Could you repair it with regular concrete? It it depends on the design of your UHPC. So if you were strengthening your deck with UHPC, then you're assuming the UHPC is offering you certain certain resistance. You need to if somehow the UHPC is damaged, you're going to need to get that resistance back. So I don't know if you're going to be able to do that with conventional. Um, All right. Uh, no, that's fine. And then the other question is, can you repair UHPC? With a UHPC patch, um, yes, I that that is that is certainly possible. Um, one of the biggest challenges there, as as you can probably guess, is um, the interface between the two. So you have to somehow make them stick together and and transfer the forces. Um, it's a problem we have with conventional concrete. It's a problem we will also have with with UHPC. Um, so there's no magic solution, but yes, you could. Okay. Uh, a couple questions here. Uh, in terms of the UHPC structural design guidance, how much progress has Ashto T10 made, and is the framework in place? And there will be will they be balloting anything soon? <laughs> well, that, that's up to them whether they ballot something soon. Um, they they've made a good bit of progress. I mean, you know, a few years ago we didn't have anything on paper. Now we have a, 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 a sort of a full document for them to be sort of beating up, to looking at and deciding, you know, do they like this? Do they not like this? So, um, you know, we're, we're making a lot of progress. Um, you know, they're, they're hoping that they're going to have um, that, that sort of the, the committee, what, what has to happen is it has to get out of the technical committee, out of T10, to go to the full bridge committee. So sometime within the next few months, it needs to get beyond the, the technical committee so that the full committee can vote on it next summer. That is the current timeline. We will see. We will see if we make it. Uh, I hope so. Okay. Here's one that came in during the uh, your presentation. Uh, in the photo showing the tensile test, why is the crack not normal to the direction of applied tension? The diagonal crack seems to indicate some sort of shear slip. Can you please elaborate on the test results? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll bring the picture up for people who, um, so I, maybe you can see that. So, so I think what you'll see here is that the cracks tend, the, the pre-localization cracks tend to be normal to the direction of stress, but once it localizes, sometimes it um, follows multiple cracks. Um, I don't think I'd attribute that to some sort of shearing or torsion behavior. What happens is the fibers start to pull out of the matrix. And which fibers are going to pull out of the matrix? Well, that's it's going to be wherever they're stressed the highest or wherever they're the weakest. 
the weakest ones aren't all going to be on the same plane. They, they could be on multiple different planes and it's going to coalesce together to form some sort of a random, maybe not random, but some sort of shape that isn't necessarily just going to be normal to the, to the cross section that's being stressed. So um, I don't think I'd attribute it to some other structural behavior going on. I, I think it's just whatever, they're going to fail at the weakest place uh, and, and that may connect together multiple different cracks. Okay. Um, now the next question came in during your during your talk. Does the shear connection, uh, con does the shear connectors from the pre-stressed concrete beam to the deck require any special design considerations, given the two uh, F prime sub C's on the deck and the beams? Um. To put it in a nutshell, what we basically recommend is that you look at the weaker of the two materials. So if if you're connecting a UHPC component to a conventional concrete component, um, then your, your resistance is going to be driven by whichever one's weaker, which generally is going to be the conventional concrete side. Uh, the only little caveat there is at the actual interface, when you have to decide what your your C value is and your mu value for interface uh, shear friction, um, the, the friction between the two surfaces, the UHPC side might actually be slipperier. Um, and so you might use the UHPC side might be the, the, the one that offers lesser resistance in terms of that that uh, cohesion or uh, friction coefficient. Okay, we're getting uh, toward the end. I'm going to ask Don if he could come in and pick up uh, any remaining questions that have come in. Don? Thanks, Paul. Hey, Ben. So, hey. question from the gallery here. Um, smaller cross sections would produce larger beam deflections. Can you shed some light on the UHPC beam deflection characteristics? Um, yes, generally that's right. Um, so um, that is something that needs to be considered, um, but it's not um, too foreign for bridge designers. So structural steel beams also present larger deflections and we build structural steel bridges all the time. Um, so you need to look at what the actual deflection from a system standpoint, what the deflection will be, and you have to make sure that that's, that's acceptable. And there's some rules of thumb out there. And so you could come into a situation where you know, if you just looked at the engineering properties, your UHPC could become even more slender, but because of deflection considerations, you need to actually put a little beef back into it. Uh, and that's that's fine. We might have to do that that sometimes, um, but it's it's it, it's not an insurmountable hurdle to, to address deflection. All right, uh, next one. How conservative is the recommended shear equation for UHPC? In other words, is it more reliable at predicting behavior than equations from NWC, normal weight concrete. Normal weight, yeah. Um, so what what we've seen is that if you if you know the UHPC properties, um, the the relationships predict the behavior very well, and that's because it's a rational equation. What when when we developed the new model. Um, we basically got rid of some of the empiricism that comes along with conventional concrete, and we're actually saying, what resistance do you get in tension from the UHPC? So it's it's more straightforward, it's more rational. So it predicts very well. Now, we, we still have to have a fee factor for, for the unknowns. Um, so, you know, we will make sure it's safe by by uh, ensuring that, that we have enough distance between the capacity and the demand. Um, but if uh, again, if, if you understand the basic behaviors of the material, um, then the model is is pretty rational, um, so it works quite well. Good deal. Uh, last two questions. Can any lab do the new tension tests? Are there any special fixtures required? Um, well, I mean, anyone could set up to do it, but um, you do need a, a machine that can apply tension, um, and it needs to be able to grip a stick of UHPC, basically. So you need some fixturing that allows you to grab the UHPC, uh, and you have to be able to pull it uh, in a sustained way. Um, so, you know, if 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 this if it's a very um, simple lab um, that is basically used to doing compression testing of concrete, then they probably don't have the the equipment. Uh, but if it's a, a lab that that does tensile testing of structural materials, then they may have the equipment necessary in order to do it. 
Very good. And, and last question. If fibers are failing by pullout along a somewhat random plane relative to the applied force, how are you determining the theta angle denoted in the shear equations? Ooh, I think we're combining two things there. So when we do the tension tests, uh, as we get to localization, different cracks will sort of connect together. Um, but you need to look at when that localization behavior first begins to happen. And so we've run full-scale shear tests, and what we see is a lot of parallel, very tightly spaced cracks um, that align with the theta angle for shear, for beam shear. Um, and, and that is the angle where you do your capacity calculation. Um, when the beam actually sort of blows apart in shear, which is what, what we do in structural testing labs, we push things beyond failure to see how they, they perform. Um, that final angle where everything sort of falls apart may be slightly different than the angle where you where localization started to happen. But again, you, you do your capacity calculation where that angle, uh, where the theta angle is for where localization begins. Well, Ben, that's the last question. Thanks for being the closure. Okay. <laughs> closer on this double header. Uh, Mary Lou, back to you. Okay, thank, thank you, Paul and Don. We're now at the end of the sixth and the last 40 minute uh, module. Thanks again to Ben for presenting the sixth module. This completes the 2022 in depth web training, non proprietary UHPC, excuse me. All of us at the ABC UTC would like to again thank Royce, David, Kingsley, John, Atord, and Ben for sharing your expertise and experience with our participants. Thanks also to Paul, Rick, and Don for moderating the Q&A session, to Ollie for working the web room, and to all of you who attended this web training today and participated in the Q&A sessions. Great questions. We really always appreciate your questions. This web, web training is now ended. Thank you very much. <laughs>